Um, I just wanted to talk for just like a couple seconds about our transition out. And, you know, one thing that I know for certain is that uh, your soul and how it's doing is very important. Part of the reason that Ruth and I are moving into this season of sabbatical is because the condition of your soul is incredibly important. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's, it's funny, I was telling Pastor Richard and my father, like, you know, like you have, um, I've been in ministry most of my life, and, and, you know, when I was 19 or so, I kind of burnt out then because we had been in full-time ministry together doing uh, a, a work in Tampa that, unless you were there, right, it's just hard to explain, <laughs> but it was a special hard thing to do. But I kind of burn out in that season. But coming out, I learned at a young age how to set parameters in my life with ministry so I didn't burn out doing the work of God. I didn't let my oil run out, you know? But in my, what I was telling the pastor, I was like, you know, what's funny about this season is I didn't burn out in ministry. I burnt out, like, in life. I was like, life got me, you know? Like, I, it's like when so much went wrong for so long, uh, physically in my wife's body and just numerous different things that happened in our lives, I was like, we were just hit by one wave after another, and, it, and, it, and, about, and it, what it did is it began to degradate my soul and wear me down. And there's this prayer that Jesus prayed. Uh, he said that he prayed it for us. He said, God, I pray that they would be one as you and I are one. And that prayer wasn't just for, like, the body of Christ at large. I believe it was that. But I believe it was also that we inwardly would be one as he is. Because there's something in us, like, our, when we are disjointed, our, 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 our spirit, our soul, and our body. He wants that to come into alignment, that we inside would be one like he is, that our life would look like the Trinity. Are you guys with me? Are you following what I'm saying? So that there's something in us. So, that, so when your soul is out of alignment, something is off, and it needs to come back in submission with the spirit. And that is my journey right now is praying that God would restore my soul in the season of my life, restore my wife's soul. And I, I would challenge you to search deep and ask God to restore your soul because there's something on it. So I'm really excited about this word today. It's not an easy word, and I have a lot to say in a short period of time, but I want you to kind of go on this journey with me, and I'll do my best to quantify everything I'm saying because it's not some of the stuff is, is if you were here in the first service, you know it's not some of the stuff I'm saying. It almost sounds shocking when it comes out of my mouth. But if you hear the heart behind it, you know, listen for the heart behind what I'm saying. That's what I'm asking for you today. Hear my heart. Don't, don't always, like when I say something, don't get by, by the shock value of it. Don't let it, don't let it rob you of, the, of what's there, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking about real sustainable power. And every, you know, every year that passes as I grow older and as I'm maturing, I become more and more infatuated and, uh, and perplexed and, 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 and I lean towards things that involve sustainability. Yeah. That, that everything that, I, that I'm thinking about is about sustainability now, about like things that don't just last a week or a month but, or a year, but like really last for like a generation or two or three beyond me creating things and being a part of things that are actually sustainable. And I, you know, and I've been, you know, th this sermon that I'm going to be speaking out today out of Acts 2, you know, I've heard a thousand sermons about these and almost every single one has been centered around power, but not many people talk about sustainability. See, and, and you know, and I, power, like, you know, I, I love power. Who doesn't love power? But the problem with this idea that pe when people fall in love with power, it's, it's, it's normally about what one can gain. You know, it's, whether that's attention, notoriety, platforms, authority, where, where things seem to get off in most people is where they don't even know why they were given power in the first place. And a lot of people think that the Lord is attracted to power. Like, if I get more power, or if I have more power, that the Lord is somehow paying more attention to me. But the thing is, is that in all actuality, that people think the Lord is attracted to that, but what's kind of funny is he seems to be attracted to weakness. In fact, his power is made perfect in weakness. And he likes to use the foolish things of this world and the weak th things of this world to, to confound the strong and, and to shame those who think they're wise. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. And, and, and Jesus and Paul's sermons and teachings were full of this kind of lang language and rhetoric. But people do not preach these parts of it because it doesn't preach that well and it doesn't sell well. 
It's really hard to share these things because it, and, and, you know, and you really don't need to sell the gospel, but people are still trying to do it. And we have whole teachings and other gospels based upon self-help, how to make yourself more powerful so you can f- um, finally function right, how you can fix what is broken inside of you, how you can take your life under control. And I, I would think that the you is normally the problem in these equations. The problem with self-help is the self. That's why you need the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of you. Because everything that you produce always will have a limit. That's why it's all right, Galatians 5. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of Jordan. Anytime that I try to love on my own, I tap out. Anytime I try to have joy on my own, I tap out. Anytime I try to be faithful on my own, I tap out. You guys following a trend here? That you need to partake of a fruit that you aren't, don't have on your own. That's why Peter talked about, I, I look at First Peter and, and, and Galatians 5 as, sis, as, as brother and sister verses, like that you, to be a partaker of the divine nature, it's like being able to partake of the fruit of the Spirit and assimilate it and let it digest into your body so that you can actually function in joy and actually function in love with something that is not your own because you'll always tap out. Are you with me? Amen. So I feel this way about power. So we have whole, we, you know, so if a lot of people think if they have more control, then that's what power means because the definition of power, one of the definitions in, in, the, in, the, in the dictionary is control. But the thing is, it was so interesting about the way things work in the kingdom is that you get power when you relinquish control. That's backwards. That's so backwards from what we, what we think today is that we, like we, you know, if you try to hold on to things and take control, you're actually, you're automatically starting to lose your power in the kingdom. So the bottom line is, is that you cannot do anything on your own. We were not created to live outside of unity, community, or communion. And every time that we try to function on our own, we are already failing. In Genesis 1, we were created out of relationship for relationship to perpetuate relationship. Genesis 1 says, let us create man in our image. Man and woman, he created them. We were created out of an us. Your children were created out of an us. That everything, so there has to be some sort of relational thing that needs to take place for anything to be inseminated and for life to continue. All life is founded in relationship. Are you with me? So, so, so even the Godhead, he said, let us make man in our image. We were created out of relationship for relationship to perpetuate relationship. You're with me. So when it comes to power and relationship, I want to talk today, I want to come from an angle that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Acts 1 and 2 from, but it, it's, I've been studying it for a few years, and every time I go back to it, the Lord's, it's kind of become my life's message now. And it's all I can see. When I, when I look at the scriptures, I have a lens on my life, and, if it, and it's just if I don't see it through the lens of relationship, I have to wait until I'm mature enough to go back and see it through the lens of relationship, literally. Because in, in every single thing I see through Scripture now, I see through the lens of relationship. And it's changed the way I read. So as, as I dive into this, I just want you to hold on with me. Be patient with me. Let me quantify what I'm saying before you jump to a conclusion. Because, no, I actually really, really care about how this is delivered. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Acts uh, chapter 1. One of the most famous, if you're a Pentecostal, this is our verse, y'all. This is like, this is our bread and butter, okay? And, and I've, heard, I've heard a bunch of great sermons on this over the years, and I just kind of want to sift through this a little bit. So uh, just so you guys know, these words that are about to come out of Jesus' mouth, take, this all happens right, at, right before he's about to be ascended, and uh, he had resurrected, and he had been working with the disciples for a few days, and he was getting ready to send about 40 days, something like that. He's been with the disciples. And he says these words, so, he, so, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you, he goes, but let me tell you this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up in a, in a cloud, in a cloud and, they, and taken out of their sight. So I just want to break down a few things here. I love how Jesus is still having to talk to these guys about the same thing he's been talking about for three years. So they're like, yes, you resurrected. We weren't expecting that. This is great. You're here. So is now the time that you're going to, like, fix everything? And then he's like, oh, you guys are still asking the wrong questions. You're still just trying to get out of here. The work is just about to begin. It's not that you, for you to know the times of the season. That's why, you know, you know, really, you know, the whole rapture theology, this whole exit theology, just like, man, you know, you, you know what? You don't take care of things or try to sustain things when it don't matter to you and you're just going to leave it. So about a hundred and some years ago, this rapture theology, which did not exist, this exit theology, they're just like, we're, you know, this is what we're going to do, God. We're going to try to do your job and we're going to pray that you do our job. We're going to say to you, we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to separate ourselves from the world because we're afraid it's going to make us dirty and unholy. And we're just going to work on our holiness, which is God's job. And we're going to pray to you to change the world, which is our job. What a, what a backwards thing to do. And we got into this whole thing that we just wanted to perpetuate. Um, you know, just like, I'm just trying to live long enough so that Jesus would come back and get me out of here. <laughs> Because this is all bad and it's dirty and I don't want it to corrupt me. And the Lord's like, I actually created you to be an occupier, to have dominion, and to expand the borders of the garden into all of humanity. Man's, man, our mandate has not changed since day one. Are you with me? So we were actually praying for God to take away our mandate. That's what we do when we think this way. So the disciples are still there. And he goes, Jesus said, you know what? You're asking the wrong questions, but that's fine. But let me tell you what you do need to know. You're, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And you're going to be my witnesses to the rest of the world. And you're going to bring restoration to every nation. Right. And so what I love about this is that Jesus' ability to, to redirect, he did it all the time with them. And he just re re redirected them back to the Holy Spirit. And he actually prayed this back in John 17 and and Jesus' prayers were just like, which really, John 17 should be called the Lord's Prayer. Like, the Lord's Prayer, that we call the Lord's Prayer, should be called the Disciples' Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is really John 17. If you read it from his perspective, it's mind-blowing. And, and, you know, and really, he's talking about, I want to send. I, he's, I want, he was talking about a helper. And, you know, Jesus knew what it was like to live life with this helper, dependent on this helper. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So... Throughout history, we have seen tons of power released over the years. Uh, you know, they've had tons of different names, revivals, awakenings, renewal, revolutions, etc. But, you know, I don't know if you ever noticed, but the, that they ultimately have not been sustainable beyond a generation or even beyond a few years, most of them. And I've been, in my heart, it, you know, and I, I've seen these things, and I've been able to work and hear stories from, like, Pastor Richard from the Brownsville Revival and, and Pastor Stephen Schrader, who I worked with in Lakeland, of the Lakeland Outpouring, and, and worked with guys from the Toronto Blessing, and I've worked with guys from the Bethel Movement and people who, in Kansas City, you know, I've been able to get around and hear from these different guys. And what I hear is I, I, not a lot of talk about sustainability, not a ton. And it began to bother me, and, and it's actually began to stir something in me, so... So I've been asking myself, what are some things that we can realistically do and pass to the next generation so that we can actually have a sustainable movement that actually grows and doesn't have to do this tank and then somebody get us stirring and try to do it again? And I was like, is there something that we can actually build upon here? So it, with that said, can we turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 1? This verse right here is, um, to me, I'm going to spend the next few minutes here, solely talking about this sentence. When I begin to understand this, this first passage of Acts chapter 2, it messed with my brain. It messed me up. Acts chapter 2, two verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. 
So I want to get a, to kind of set up a little bit of stage for this. So what, what was happening? So you, you have the disciples between Acts 1, uh, 6 to 8, and Acts 2. What is taking place there? So basically Jesus ascends into heaven. And they're all just like looking around. They're like, what the heck? Like he's gone. Like that was my plan, y'all. He was the plan. What are we doing? And they're just looking around and just like, what are we going to do? And so they did the only thing that I believe they knew to do is you, you guys heard the upper room experience. In fact, that's where this takes place. Acts chapter two, they always called it the upper room. And uh, a lot of theologians believe that this is the same upper room that was mentioned in chapter Luke when Jesus said, go find an upper a room for us to have communion. A place for us to, to meet with each other. And, and this is where they had the last supper. So a lot of theologians, and I personally believe that this is the place that all they knew to do was go to the last place that they had real communal relationship with Jesus. The last thing that they could remember is like, well, he's gone now. Great. So he said, wait, where are we going to wait? Who has a house? You know, like, I guess we'll just go back here. So they, they go back to the last thing they knew. And I believe from what I understand is I had this picture in my mind from growing up from a ton of great sermons that it was a time full of lots of constant painted faces and lots of ah, like, God, pay attention to us. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. Revival prayers. Notice me. And I, and I honestly thought that's what it was. But something began to shift in me. I began, I began studying what they were doing. You know, they, they said they, they, they came together and they prayed. What's the last thing that Jesus told them to do? Communion. He said, anytime we're together, remember me. So I'm, I start getting this picture. Like, it starts coming together in my mind. They're, they're in this room for this 10 days before the day of Pentecost after he ascends. And they're just, they're, they're there, 120 of them. Can you imagine this? 120 people, kind of hot and sticky, you know, you know, in that room. And, they're, and, you know, really all they can do is begin to prep for the feast that's coming, Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, and sit together, eat, pray, and talk. And they also did some business. They're like, hey, that Judas guy did not work out, did it? We probably should get, uh, we probably should replace that guy. So they did some business. You know, it was very, it was a, it was a, a casual things were going on, highly relational and communicative things. They're in this small confined space, forced to sit at a table and look at the person across from them eye to eye. And not, they're not just forced to, to, to sit at the table with, uh, you know, they're sitting there with, you know, Matthew, the text collector, and a couple of fishermen, and it, you know what I'm saying? A doctor, uh, you know, they're all from different walks of life. A lot of them are second borns who have been passed on, passed up on. And Jesus is like, oh, I like those guys. They're just sitting, and then there's women there, former prostitutes and stuff like that. They're just all chilling together. You know what? Back in their culture, like men and women did not. That was not a thing. All of a sudden, for them to be at the table with the men, this was not culturally a thing that was happening, okay? So they're already on the start to something really, really cool. So, so this is all happening right here. Acts 2.1. So... So, I, so many believe that they were in this upper room and that this, and, and I, I think, I know that they were in this like forced funnel of community. It was like a forced funnel, like I, he told me to wait here and I'm stuck waiting with you. So we're going we're gonna to wait together. I don't even know if I like you, bro, but we're going we're gonna to figure this out, you know, and you're, you're a woman. I don't even know what, you used to be a prostitute. This is weird for all of us. You know, you know what I mean? Are you with me? And they're in this space together, in this funnel of like, I either get to, I have no other choice. He told me to wait. So this word right here, together in the Greek, it's a word that says, it says hamu. And hamu means all together, it means, it means the same or without difference. Something happened in this word where no matter where these people were, where they came from, or what their story was, the differences disappeared. Something happened in this funnel of forced relationship. I'm being honest. They were stuck in a room together. 
Sounds a lot like a church sometimes. You're stuck in a room together with people from all very different walks of life, with very different jobs, different histories, and guess what? This is who you're supposed to change the world with. So this word together, it wasn't until they were the same or without difference. So it didn't matter if you were a woman, didn't matter if you were a man, didn't matter the hierarchy, didn't matter if you were Peter or you're John who always said that he was the best disciple in his, in his personal opinion because he wrote John. <laughs> He's like, D John, the disciple Jesus loved. And then Peter's like, I never, I could write that. You know, like, you see what I'm saying? It's like Moses, you know, Moses, you know, you know, it, it, he's, Moses is the most humblest man on the face of the earth. It says that in Exodus. Moses wrote Exodus. So of course he was to him. <laughs> it's a joke, guys. You can laugh. It's okay. So you have, uh, so what else was going on here? You know, it was, you know, it was also the Feast of Weeks. So during the Feast of Weeks, it was a time, Pentecost is what it is. Pentecost is the Greek word it means 50 it's 50 days after passover and it was during the 50 during the feast of weeks it was a celebration of the grain harvest when they was i mean wheat it was they would, when they would be harvesting wheat and they would cook these two loaves and they would wave these two loaves this is weird stuff i don't really understand it but it was a representation of the lord bringing jew and gentile together it's a beautiful thing also a relational restoration but, you know, I began uh, studying some of the things. I was like, God, what, what was happening here? What are some things that were culturally? So as I began studying the Feast of Weeks, I, I began to notice some things that were really unique. All, everybody in the upper room, pretty much all of them were uh, Jewish. And so they had things that they would be doing. And one of the things that I discovered that they did is they would spend time the night before, moving into the day of Pentecost, into the morning. They would stay up through the night reading the Torah. And they would start reading the scriptures. And they would start... Looking, they would look at two different passages. They would look at Moses at Sinai, but they would also look at, they would indent the book of Ruth, which I think is such an interesting thing. So throughout Jewish history, it would be customary to engage in these all-night studies. And um, the children were actually encouraged to memorize the scripture, and they would be rewarded with treats if they could remember as much of the book of Ruth as possible. So the book of Ruth was traditionally read, and, I, and as I began to read this, I began to get flooded with all these different thoughts. Why is Ruth so important? So here they are, I believe, all forced in this small room at a dinner table, getting ready for a feast the next day, just probably eating some bread and some wine and remembering Jesus the best they can and talking about Ruth. Something happened here. Something had to have happened here that shifted everything. And see, what are some of the things we know from Ruth? That Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth was, she was not a Jew, she was a Moabite, and, and she was highly, the Moabites were discriminated against if they, in, in the Jewish culture. It said in Deuteronomy 23, it says, no Moabite will be accepted by God. This was a law. This was a law. So no Moabite would be accepted by God, but then you had, but, all, but then all of a sudden, <laughs> What's funny is that in Ruth's story, she's actually, when she marries Boaz, they end up having a son named Obed, and Obed ends up fathering Jesse down the line. Jesse fathers David, the king of Israel, and from the line of David, we get Jesus. So the thing is, is that in this moment, and we, if you know the story of Ruth, that it shows that God is concerned about all people, regardless of their race, nationality, or gender. Amen. That God cared about women and he cared about people who felt like they were on the outside and he cared about them whether they were a gentile or not being brought into the family of god Amen. because there's a law of love that supersedes all Amen. and this is what jesus came to show us he showed it with a seraphonician woman he showed it with so many like he would he, am i a dog that i come to the table and he's like whoa i haven't seen faith like this this is what i'm talking about she's family It shows that men and women are both equally important to God. It shows that there's no such thing as an unimportant person in God's eyes. So this is what we're gleaning from the story of Ruth. And what I love is that as they're meditating on this story, I believe there's something to begin to happen. 
something, a connection started to begin to happen. The women started looking at the men and the barriers started going down. The men was looking at the women and the barriers were going down. They were looking into the eyes of one another and they were actually seeing each other for what they really were. Real relational connection started happening at that table again. So this is all happening right there. So relationship, so people think that power can only come from prayer and fasting. And it's, there is a power that comes from it. But not the only power. Because they were, in this case, they were prepping for, they were prepping for feast. They were living out communion. They were remembering him. And then they were doing relationship. And then boom, power was all of a sudden there. The power that came that day was from relationships starting to be restored because God deeply cares about them. See, the whole Trinity is are the God that we serve are three distinct and separate individuals that live in perfect submission to each other. And they, they live in the submission so well that we don't even know who's doing what. And their covenant with one another is so perfect that we only have one name for him and it's God. Which is the way that marriages are supposed to look. This is the way that the church is supposed to look. This is the way that our relationships are supposed to look. Is that all of a sudden that we, that people look at us and they're like, oh shoot, that's Jesus. Who, who just walked in the room? It was just some dude. <laughs> he just walks in the room and, and all of a sudden the atmosphere changes. Why? Because there's somebody who has been brought into right relationship and is living from right relationship. So, so you know, so when their relationship began to look like the Trinity's, then he poured out power. So, when they were all the same, then he poured out the power. If I, if I can't learn to love you, there is something about him that I don't love. So you can go to the next verse, this little verse here, 1 John 4, 20. This, this one will bite you in the butt, trust me. It, it bites me there quite often. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. What you have to the right and to the left of you is him. Everyone's created in the image of the creator. So if there's something about the person next to you that you, you can't love it, there's something about him that you don't love, sorry. You know, like one of the things that hurt me was like, you can't love God and hate Obama. Or Trump. Let's just start there. Let's just start there. Yeah, it, you, you don't get to do that. I'm sorry. Like, I, it doesn't matter what you feel like people deserve, but like, aren't you glad you didn't get what you deserve? You know, like, you know, there, there's a lot of people that I don't, I don't have to like everything that everybody does, but I am actually called and commanded to love. To love the Lord your God, your heart, your soul, and your mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. So you have to love yourself 100% in order to love your neighbor 100%. Because your love for your neighbor is always tapped out based upon your love for yourself. So if you're like, oh, I'm having such a hard time loving my, loving my neighbor or loving this person, I'm like, oh, that's an issue with you. Yeah. It actually, man, what it shows us is that it's, we have that issue. We don't love ourselves. Because a person who loves himself 100% has no problem giving love away 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And the love for God's easy after that. So if we're not willing to love our brother and our sister, we're not ready for real power. So many want power, but they want it on their own and on their own terms, and that is impossible to sustain. But what about what they're doing? What about their past? Aren't you glad that uh, what God is doing in you is not predicated upon your past? Or predicated upon what you were doing? Or how qualified you were? Aren't you glad that love is uh, unconditional, which means without... Yeah. See, that is hard, ain't it? Because all of you guys, I'm looking at all the minds turning. All of you are thinking about 40 people right now that are, you're like, no, sir. <laughs> and, and it's good. I, it offends my mind, and I'm trying to offend yours. Are you with me? Everybody's like, I don't know if I love you anymore. 
So just picture this. Jesus had to make a choice to love everybody who beat him, ripped his beard, crucified him, and he did not sin against them. And the only way that he could do this is because he was in right relationship with his helper. The only way that he could do it is because he wasn't, a, he had the helper with him. I don't know if you remember this, the spirit. It didn't, it didn't like fly away. Oh, I wish I could talk about that. <clears throat> I, I was taught growing up. I'm, okay, I'm going to offend some people, okay? Just but please work with me here. Listen to my heart. I was taught that the Holy Spirit, it was like a dove, right? Because he came ascending on Jesus like a dove. And that if you move in a wrong way, the Holy Spirit's like, I'm out. I'm out of here. You know what I'm saying, right? And I, I, I respect the analogy, but it just, it's not true because I've been in the middle of my sin, a mess, screwing up everything. And the Holy Spirit's just like my mother, just like right there. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? How can I help? Borderline annoying. Borderline won't leave me alone. Just like, how can I help? What do you need? Can I serve you? Let me help you with this, because you're trying to do it on your own, and you're failing. It's not the fruit of you. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Are you with me? So, like, I, I'm, try, sh I'm trying to shift our, the way we view this, okay? So, next slide. You cannot restore what you do not love. This is why the Lord is restoring the way we do relationships, because if you, if you feel this call to help restore all things, which is inside of you because you're, you're a child of God, you have this desire to restore. If you feel called to restore, you cannot do that if you don't fall in love with it. Next slide. You cannot be unified with what you do not love. You cannot walk in unity with someone that you don't love. It's pointless. It's a fruitful fight. I've tried it. It's tough. <laughs> but if you love, you can walk with unity about anybody. You don't have to agree with every, you don't have to agree on everything to walk in agreement. Right. Right. I mean, like all the time, my wife and I, we don't agree on everything. We've chosen to walk in agreement. Are you with me? Okay. So anyway, that's Acts 2, verse 1. Are you guys with me? That's, what we, that's what's happening. Go to the, Acts 2, verse 2. So I want to talk about what happens now. So just hold on, hold on to your butts. We're about to go, okay? Acts 2, verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews and devout men from every nation under heaven. So I want to talk about that. The reason that there was a ton of people there from everywhere is because it was a feast. Whenever they had a feast, which was three times a year, everybody went. All the merchants, all the Jews, everybody made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So there was a ton of people there. Go to verse 6. And as the sound, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are, are not all these who are speaking, aren't they just Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? So this was Parthians, and hold, I'm going to try, I'm going to do my best here, guys. And it, this was Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Philampia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own language the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? So I just want to talk about this for a second. Everyone that's mentioned, if you look in verse 9 through verse 11, everyone mentioned there. All these people that I could barely pronounce. All those peoples have been persecutors of Israel. All of them. And if you look throughout this, the Old Testament, almost in order, all these people have been persecutors of Israel. And so, like, all these people who are their persecutors are hearing in their own tongue the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So this is, this is what I want to say, and hold on, hold on here. I want you to listen to this. That I believe, you know, growing up at Pentecostal, I, you know, I believe that we've, we've pigeonholed the gift of tongues into just being able to um, Alibaba Shonda Ronda in our personal prayer life. Are you with me? There's more. The, the gift of tongues is so much more. I believe speaking in tongues is not just the ability to accentuate your prayer life, but it's actually um, the, it's being able to speak in the language of your persecutor. Come on, the real test of your gift of tongues is not whether you can shalaba holidays, whether you're in, 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 whether you're in real relationship enough to speak in the language of somebody who hates you. Whether your relationship is so right that you can walk up to people who revile you, to the boss who thinks you're nothing, and just speak a language of love, and your tongue is under a control that is not your own. It's being, see, like, that is just as much a gift. Uh, you know, and so, so, the gift of, so the gift of tongues allows you to speak in the language of any persecutor, no matter who they are. The gift of tongues does not exist just to help you communicate with God. It allows you to communicate to all things and people that restoration is here because I am here. Are you with me? This gift that we, that we, we, uh, we glorify even as the sign of the Spirit. I, I have a friend, one of my best friends. He's never, he's never been, has, he's never moved in that, the gift of tongues as we know it today. But I've never met a young man who speaks with so much of control from the spirit. I'm like, that man's got the gift. He doesn't even know it. Verse 13. We're just, move, we're just gonna move through these verses. We're almost done with Acts 2. Verse 13, it says, but... But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For this people are not drunk as you suppose. This is only the third hour of the day. I love how Peter's like, it's too early, guys. We haven't been drinking yet. <laughs> and, you know, and I was, you know, like, one thing I love about drunk people and we, we were talking about this in the first service. Is you, when you're drunk, it either magnifies somebody's best qualities or their worst qualities. Right? We, we know this. And what, see, the thing is, is that they weren't drunk. But what the spirit, when the spirit came alive in them, when they were baptized in the spirit, it magnified all of their best qualities. And everybody's just looking like, y'all, it's barely 9 o'clock and y'all out here like going 100. You guys are like, you guys are, I mean, and they're just so full of love. They're so full of life. They're so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. They're ready to go. And because they're, they're, they're seeing everybody, because relationship had been restored between them, they were ready to bring everybody else back into relationship as well. So they're looking around at everybody, and they're just ready to go. They're all like lovey-dovey, just like a drunk person, and they're ready, man. And everybody's like, it's like the third hour of the day. I'm a Roman. Why are you talking to me? I'm a Muslim, Arabs. Why are you talking to me? They, they were all there. Are you with me? Yeah. So when relationship had been restored, they were able to come out of this place, and people were so put off by it, they got to be drunk. This don't make any sense why you're talking to me. Are you with me? Right. So, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed him. Oh, go, go to the next verse. Excuse me. Next verse. Yeah. Verse 16, so it says, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So he begins to prophesy out of Joel chapter 2, which is a very famous prophecy from the Old Testament. He says, and in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall uh, see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on the male servants and on the female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in, uh, in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, Blood, fire, vapor, and smoke, and the sun shall turn to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day, uh, the great and powerful day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon in the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to talk about this for a second. What do you notice about the prophecy that he's prophesying? 
He's saying directly out of Joel chapter 2, look at these. It's about sons and daughters, young men and old men, servants who are male and servants who are female. It's about everyone gets a place at the table of communion. Everyone has a role. Everyone gets to do it. I don't care if you're a servant or if you're a pauper or a king. You have a place in the family of God. This whole prophecy is about family restoration. This whole prophecy is about relationship coming back into the kingdom. Coming back into the family and bringing us into the kingdom. This whole thing in Acts 2 and the whole launch of the church was about relationships getting right so that something could be sustainable. All right. Are you with me? So I spent, so if you fast forward down to Acts 2, verse 42, this day that says that 3,000 were saved that day. 3,000, not just Jews, but people from every, everyone who was there, man, just Romans and Arabs, people who were hearing the good news of God, people who were supposed to not be able to be in the family. All of a sudden, the Gentile and the Jew are coming together to start the church. The outsider and the people who thought they were in are now family. And this starts this thing that if, you know, this is what the church should look like. Acts 2, 40 through 47, 42 through 47. This is my, my life's goal to see manifested. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Can somebody say all things? And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them, the proceeds to all as they any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, communion, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with what? All the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being our saved. So I want to say something about all. All is all, everybody. Not just in the church. See, they had favor with all people. That when relationships started being restored with them, people started seeing a body language that was so attractive that they had to be a part of it. See, the problem with the church, and it's not hard to point out problems. You know, I always tell people, like, you know, it's easy to point out problems. It's, you are not prophetic if you point out problems. Right. Stating the obvious is not that prophetic. Being able to be all like, hey, let me tell you what's wrong with you. Thanks, bro. You know, like that, that doesn't, that's not that prophetic. But to call things that are not as though they are, that's a prophetic gift. To see something before it's manifested or in spite of what it's manifesting, that's a prophetic gift. And I'm going to tell you right now, we need more of that. Because there's a world that doesn't look, that is, is operating and manifesting in a way that it was not created to be. We have to see it for what it really is. And the only way that you can see that is if your relationship here with people and here is right. Otherwise, you'll never be able to see it. So that all is the body language. See, our body language is off. See, the, the words coming out of the Father's mouth, the head, are the truth. But the problem is, is that our body language, the body of Christ, is not in alignment with the words. And that's why you get like Hillsboro Baptist Church and a bunch of weird stuff. It's off. And everybody's like, see, that's not Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, I could have told you that. Praising God and having favor with all men who are outside the family and inside the family. Two more verses and we're done. So I, I thought my whole life that Acts 2 was about power, but I was wrong. It was about relationships being restored. So that power can lead the entire world to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that we can actually have a sustainable move that actually our children can adopt and maintain. Because children can adopt love, but they cannot adopt the systems that we've been putting in place. Because the systems are always subject to whatever generation, to whatever time, you know? Those will evolve. We have to teach the love right so that they can develop systems for their own time. Otherwise, it's just not sustainable. Nothing we do is sustainable. 
So we got to get DNA right. 1 John 13, 34 through 35. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Our proof to the world is not in what we say as much. Like, like it's, it's how we actually are treating one another. Who would have thought, who would have thought that how we are just treating one another is how we're going to prove to the world that we are his disciples. And see, like, when they look at us right now, all they see is something that's disjointed and broken, right? And they're, all, and they're all like, just telling us the truth. It's not prophetic. They're just telling us the truth. <laughs> they're just like, hey, I don't want to be a part of that. And I'm all like, man, I don't know if I blame you. Right now. I'm dedicated to it. I love it. I'm going to spend my whole life being a part of this. Are you guys following me, though? It's not, it's, I'm not surprised that people don't want to be a part of it. Because... They look at how we treat one another and like, yeah, I don't need that. I don't need that. I, I have people who treat me bad at home. Like, why would I go there and get it too? Like, so, <laughs> so 1 Peter 4, 7, and then I'm done. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. But check this. But most important of all, Continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. You need to be disciplined in your prayers. But most importantly, if you're moving in love, it'll cover a multitude of sins. How we treat one another is as important as we treat him in our private time. In fact, in Peter's words, he says it's more important. Are you with me? We have to treat each other right. Cheerfully share your home with those who have need or a meal or a place to stay. God has given to each one of you a gift uh, from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to what? Serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all power and glory to, and to and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Listen, and I wrap with this. Jesus, I mean, Peter, excuse me, Peter put, I love how he put speaking, those who speak from a platform on equal standing with those who serve. What we do up here is no more special than what you are doing in a nursery or what you are doing uh, when you're serving someone who's older than you, helping somebody to their car. See, these things are on the same level. The reason that these exist is because people who are far away need a chance to see Jesus. That's it. That is it. That's why platform ministry exists. That's why it was the Sermon on the Mount. People need to be able to hear who feel like they're far away. So certain people have that gift. Don't be mad that you don't. If what you, if what you have is the ability to serve, then do it with all of the strength that God supplies because it is equally as important because your role is important in the body of Christ. You are important in bringing everything back into relationship. Just because I got a louder mouth, that doesn't mean anything. Like Pastor Richard, we can talk for days and we can talk loud and, and yell in a microphone. That is not that special. It's not that special. It's just one of the gifts we got, all right? What you do for the body, what you do for the world, and how you execute it, it is part of bringing everything back in relationships. So I want to challenge you that if we can get relationships right, that is a power that can be sustained for generations. That is something that the supernatural is normal. It's super normal natural all the time. Things just pop off when relationship is right. Healing, signs and wonders, miracles, that stuff is easy if DNA is right. All those things that people are trying to attain and get on their own can be completely and effortlessly done. I've seen it done at different times, and I haven't seen it done at other times. And I know that it can be done if we can just get this right. So anyway, I love you guys. Thank you. I'm sorry for my overtime, but I appreciate you guys listening to me. It's been my pleasure to serve you. Thank you.